I'm Angelo Fick. I'll introduce the panelists in a second. I'll be facilitating the student discussion uh, for this conference for the next 45 minutes. I'm going to be quite strict about timekeeping with the students and with the audience. So if you have questions, please formulate them as a question in 20 seconds. That's usually 25 words. I will cut you off if you start doing that thing that academics like doing, which is a question that's really a thesis. Okay, so our panelists are, and they each have two and a half minutes to answer each question. They can ride on each other's answers, and um, we will come to the audience for, answer, for questions later. There are four questions that have been addressed to them. They will respond to them as a group. I might have some interposing statements or comments, and mm -hmm. we'll take it from there. So, Mr. Lechaba Muko is here from the SRC for Nelson Mandela University. He's sitting in the center. And then to his left is Ms. Khalalelo Liu, who is from the Directorate of Institutional Research and Academic Planning at the University of the Free State. And on the very far left is Mr. Sipepe Logntembu, who is from the SRC for the University of the Durban University of Technology, who's here to talk about insights and promoting student access. To my immediate left is Mr. Wayne Swart, who is from who is a student representative from the University of the Witwatersrand. And then the last student to be introduced is to his left, Mr. Percy Pakati, who is from Student Affairs at the University of Pretoria. So could we just give a warm welcome? And <laughs> Thank you. I suppose everybody's been told to switch their mobile phones off to silent or discreet or vibrate or just off. Um, emergency exits are there and there. Make your way to them orderly. <laughs> Right, so to get to the students, um, so there have been discussions about data, the use of data in uh, higher education to track student progress, dealing with student challenges and student progress in South Africa at universities, and comparing that with other spaces. In your view, and we'll begin this time from my immediate left and work our way down the panel, what role should students play in supporting other students or students as a body and their success and student success initiatives at the institution where you study? Let's begin with Wayne and work our way up to Sipepelo. Yeah. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Wayne Swart, and I was part of the targeting talent program at Wits University as a learner from grade 10 to 12. And when I came to Varsity, um, I, I, I still continued being in the program as a mentor. So that was one of the roles that I played in um, improving student success, in actually imparting the knowledge that I've gained onto, onto the, next gen, the next cohort of, of learners. But one thing that I do want to discuss um, about the role that students play is that something that's not being talked about as often as it should, especially in the generation that we as students are growing up in. We forget that we have one of the most powerful tools at our fingertips, which is social media. We're growing up in a generation where hashtags create movements. So that is like one of the, one of the roles that we can play because not everyone, especially like for me, because I'm just a third year student, we, not everyone is in leadership positions, but everyone has a voice, everyone has a platform to discuss those things. So there's one thing that can be used, which is social media, using that as a tool to create awareness and to create awareness of programs such as book drives, food donations, because we are most likely to retweet than pamphlets. So that's one of the roles that we can use as students to, 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 to create awareness basically about programs and initiatives to, to promote student success. Do you have anything else to add? They have a reward. If they cut, undercut themselves on one question, they get more time on another. So let's go to Percy. Uh, greeting to you all, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Percy from the University of Pretoria. Um, personally, I feel like the question is incomplete when it says what role should student play? In a sense, to say that it's not only the role should be played by the student, but it also should be played, there must be a role that should be played by the university. So to say that, um, I'll, I'll answer your question, but it's not complete. Uh, for, for, for the student, they should actually identify relevant committees, uh, committees that will be able to focus um, on the student goal, committees that will be able to nature uh, the student, the 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 the, the, the student goal, 
committed that we're able to ensure to engage uh, the students uh, in terms of what the students want to achieve. Committees that, that are well resourced. Committees that are connected. In a sense that when a student is done uh, undergraduate and is graduated, should able to find job quicker since the student was in the uh, committee that is well connected. And also committees that are um, that values um, the student's success. Because inverted commas, there are still there are committees which indirectly so doesn't support the student su student's success. So the critical role that students should play is to able to identify those committees. In UP we have so many committees like cultural committees, sports so committee, religious committee, social committee, <laughs> faculty houses, we have our uh, student assistantship like tutors, lectures, concession time, we have faculty student advisors, we have uh, student supporters, we have STEM mentorship program, uh, we have learning community. Learning community is one of the programs that I am a coordinator into uh, based on uh, the um, Department of uh, Student Affairs, which helps students as well. Thank you. Thanks so much. So now we've had two responses, one talking about technology, the other talking about structures um, and where and how students interface in these structures. We'll now hear from Lichaba about what happens at your institution in response to this. Um, thank you, Program Director. But let me first and foremost take this opportunity to kindly and respectfully pass my greetings to the house at large and furthermore express my appreciation for this invitation we received as student and student leaders to come and express our views and perspectives on such important matters. And let me also furthermore welcome um, the presence of international delegates, for your presence actually practicalizes and demonstrates globalization, and therefore it is important for us to unite, stay in one space, share ideas and views on how we can transform institutions of higher learning with the intention of increasing our graduation rates and furthermore to produce wise men and women who are of dignity and honor who will become the future leaders of this world. I don't want to duplicate some of the points that my colleagues have mentioned. Um, so instead, I would rather give a supplementation instead of a replication upon what has been said. And part of the roles that students should play in terms of um, the support services and programs offered in institutions of higher learning must first and foremost be effective participation. But before we speak about effective participation, we must also consider factors that affect the catalyzation of participation for students to participate in specific programs. And part of those constraints are the centralization of specific programs which are found within only one campus, where in contrast many of our universities have multiple campuses. So the decentralization of our programs into each and every campus will catalyze student participation in programs which are offered. Number two, part of my responsibility or my university's values is responsibility. And therefore it becomes necessary and imperative for students to take responsibility to make a research about what other programs are offered in different institutions of higher learning. I was doing research um, about University of Walter Sisulu, and there are many things which I learned to discover that we can also incorporate within my university. For instance, if we have a program where students should participate, the student who made the research, which is a master's student, adopted the view that programs which are based on academic enhancement must not only be for students who are perceived to be underperforming, because as such, put a stigma and affect some students within their social lives and spaces that, oh, you are the one who has to attend this program and you are therefore perceived to be a weaker student. So let those programs be open for everyone so that students are not labeled and stigmatized to say, okay, the reason why you are attending this program is because you are a weaker student in contrast to us. Thank you. Thank you. So, building on that, we now hear from Ms. Khalelelo uh, Liu, um, if you have anything to add to that. Thank you, Angelo. Um, my answer will not be as long as his. Um, 
I think the question that has been asked leads to the answer. Um, the heart of a university is the student, and the heart being a vital organ, you guys will excuse me, I am a microbiologist, so biology. <laughs> um, and the students being the heart of the university, it therefore means then that the role that the students play is vital to the uh, um, student success initiatives that are at the university. Without the students, you have no uh, uh, um, success initiatives. It just becomes a success initiative and it's not directed at anyone. So I believe that as students, we need to create um, an environment that is conducive for support across the student body, whether it is a third year student supporting a first year student, a PhD student supporting a honor student in their studies. I think it is important that we take the initiative to support each other as students. At the UFS, we are lucky enough to have a few initiatives such as the P3 Mentors, which is available at the residences that we have. It is senior students that um, form part of mentoring the first year students that come into the university. And then, as yesterday, we saw the presentation on the ASTEP initiative that is conducted by CCL. Um, that is also conducted by senior students that help the, 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 the younger students. Um, yeah, we have a few other initiatives, but I think those two, to me, stand out. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll now, for the last round on this particular question here from CPP Long um, from DUT. Thanks very much. Maybe one shall also first elaborates the role of a student in an institution of higher learning. I came across of having two perspectives about the role of a student, generally speaking, whereby a student is a receiver of an education in, in initiatives that are initiated by the institution, and also a student being a producer of an educational body of work whereby students take responsibility for every action towards such initiative of success, whereby a student is a master of his or her own work. But in addition, one can also say the role that shall be played by students in such initiatives can be having students of being their own advocates, whereby students, they make sure that whoever initiated uh, such initiatives, whoever is in charge of such initiatives, they do recognize them in a good way, though, by making sure that they participate in such initiatives and as well by making sure that they communicate their struggles with either their lecturers, HOTs, student services, and so forth, to make sure that the institution assist them in a way that they will be capacitated, in a way that they will be successful in future. But nonetheless, at least students shall also play a role in making sure that they minimize the workload in a way that they do and try make minimum or cover minimum work on daily basis that is done to make sure that they bridge the gaps that may be formed in the near future. But nonetheless, uh, I always leave a room for introduction so as the end of my presentation. My name is Sipa Pelumtim from TUT. Thanks. Thank you. They're very good at timekeeping, much better than academics, I find. <laughs> So as somebody who did used to go on as an academic, I will also be short. So in these answers that you gave today now, you started talking about some of the measures that are available at your institutions to afford student support services and to support students towards success. But to what extent are there spaces at your universities for students to insert their voices to be heard? And if they are there, how do you think they can be improved, those spaces in which student voices can be heard by the institution on issues of success. We'll begin on that side of the panel and work our way this way. Okay. Thanks again. Uh, in my institutions, there are plenty of sectors whereby students can be able to raise their voices. Specifically, we've got departmental representatives where there are uh, students that are elected by their own representative to represent them whenever they've got issues. Your faculty representatives, your house community representatives and us as the SRC. But coming back to the issue of success, we've got Center for Excellent Learning and Teaching in DUT, 
whereby the institution provides tutors in both on campus and on residences as well. I think when it comes to that one, it really needs to be improved because there is a challenge whereby there are students that reside on home without being on campus on daily basis and without being on residences, understanding their background as they are previously disadvantaged. I think there must be a way whereby we try and accommodate those students in a way that if it means that the program shall be extended during weekends where we, they will be able to come on campus and attend such programs for their own benefits, by the way. The institution shall be a, 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 a make means for them to come and attend. Thank you. Uh, um, at the UNF UFS, um, we have, okay, one of the voices that we have is the module evaluations that we have, which evaluates the module in its entirety, from the content presented to the lecture halls, laboratories, um, the way in which the lecture presents, um, the uh, um, contact that you have with your uh, um, lecturer. Um, and it has been found that a lot, of the, a lot of the times the lecturers appreciate the section in the evaluation where the um, students give feedback in, in a form of writing out what they were happy with, whatever additional comments they may have in addition to what was on the survey. Um, besides the module evaluations, I know of two faculties which have faculty committees, being the um, law faculty and the education, fac the faculty of education. In the law um, uh, um, faculty, they have a society which is comprised of students that obviously are in contact with the department as well as the students, and it's similar in the, in the education faculty. And then obviously we have the SRC, which is rep represented on two levels in the government structures of the university. Um, there is a project that is going to be undertaken now under the leadership of our DVC academic Dr. Liz Langer, which is about student governance and amplifying the voices of the student. And it takes it right from management down to modular level to find out um, how can the students from the module to the faculty level, how can they amplify their voice or how can the university be made aware of their feelings or emotions about the university and the content at large? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, responses from the other participants, starting with Kichapa. Thanks. Thanks once again, our program director. Let me just add on what um, my previous speaker just said in terms of evaluation forms that students should fill in to express their views on the conduct of teaching and learning. I think it becomes very necessary and important for institutions of higher learning to have such recommendations to be something that has to be put in policy. Because policy will make it something that becomes an obligation for lecturers to have instead of it being an option. Institutional policies must have stipulations where it becomes necessary for lecturers to have evaluation forms so that students can express their views. And I also commend the remarks which were made in terms of the SRC. Remember the Student Representative Council is a statutory body that is recognized in the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa, which is authorized to represent the best interest of students and to be the voice in the tears of the students in Senate, Menko and Council. So I think it must be the first body of approach that the students should consult with because many a times you'd find that the Student Representative Council and its members are far more than passionate about representing the voices of the students so as to champion their issues. But apart from the SRC itself, and this is the reason why we always advocated for more on-campus residences, because on-campus residences, you have mentors, you have house comps, you have residence student assistants, you have even residence managers that students can consult with. And the contrast and the distinction that we can have between the rest manager and the mentors uh, when students have preferences to whether I should approach someone who is of the same age as me in terms of a particular issue, 
in contrast to where they have to maybe attend to a risk manager or consult with a risk manager in another issue. So it gives them the capacity and the opportunity to approach in terms of their preferences. Thank you. Thank you so much. Pasi, you have an extra 30 seconds to respond. All right. um, thank you. Um, in our university, we are having a uh, class representative. Uh, we're having SRC forums. Uh, class representative, they are actually uh, like a bridge between student and um, uh, the module coordinator or the lecturer. But then many a times we find that, as my learned friend here said, um, students don't, especially the student representative, they end up representing uh, the interest of the lecturer, not the interest of the student. That's an issue that I have. And also the issue that I have about the voice of uh, being heard uh, from the student. Imagine if that is a doll, and then inside there is a mother, and then outside the doll there is a boy. And then the boy keep on knocking and say, Mom, I need food inside. And then the mother will be like, I, okay, um, I'm busy with something that I have to adjust there and there. And then the boy keep on knocking, Mom, I need a uh, place to stay inside. And then the mother will be like, okay, um, uh, I'm busy trying to fix that and that. And then you find that at the end of the day, the boy will be aggressive and broke the door. This is what's happening in our universities. Who hears the voice? Is it the question of to say the university is hearing the voice or they're ignorant to the voice? Or is it that the students are not actually uh, projecting the voice in a correct manner? So that's why you end up seeing so much violence uh, in our universities, unbearable. It's because of this, there should be one person who's going to stand up and mother and open the tents and hear what the boy wants to say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <coughs> now we'll hear from Wayne and then I'll interrupt with the new diversion to the program. So, <coughs> um, hi everyone, I'm back. <laughs> what was so interesting about this question and I'd like to just um, provoke your thoughts is it says that what structures are in place to ensure that student voices are heard. We have the SRC, we have student councils, we have the Dean of Students Advocates, and even in our faculties we have school councils specific, especially my faculty, Commerce Law and Management, so we'd have the School of Economic and Business Sciences, so they'll have their own faculty, the School of Accountancy will have their own council, sorry, not faculty, <coughs> council, and the School of Law will have their own student council. Student voices are being heard, but are we listening to students? That's the important thing. Our voices, we speak, we speak, we speak. It, it's, it's, it's like white noise all over the place, but are we actually listening? And the only way that you can prove that you are listening is if you give feedback to the voices that are being heard. Because I can, com an example, I can complain to the student council, my lecturer, whatever complaint I have with my lecturer, if I don't get feedback that change was being made, my voice was just heard, but no one listened to my complaint. And what, what is so interesting about how we can improve that is not just hearing, but listening and actually doing something about it and taking it seriously. Because just as Ms. Liu said, that we are the heartbeat of the university. Without students, there's, no, there's nothing, essentially. And another thing that was interesting during this conference, like when I was preparing for pre the conference, was synergy that was being discussed. Is, are, are all these structures in place, are, are they all working together or are they just working in silos? So that's another thing that, just to think about. Yes, thank you, Anna. Thank you. Thanks, I will take questions from the floor in a second, but what I want the participants to prepare for is at the end to wrap up their statements. We will come back to another question to you, don't worry. <laughs> but at the very end, to begin to work towards that conclusion. So you've talked about the structures in universities that exist and how they function and how they, ideally I presume a lot of this is utopian, how they should function. But you're also living on campuses where over the last two years there have been substantial voices on all campuses in South Africa questioning the legitimacy of those structures and the way in which they represent student interests and the success with which they've worked, particularly the SRCs, the student councils, etc. So what, in addition to the already existing 50-year-old structures, do we need in this moment in history? Might be something to think about towards the end. 
But for the moment, are there questions from the floor to the panelists of the responses they've given thus far? I'll take three. You're academics, you will have questions. Come. <laughs> Imagine it's a lecture and you've. Right, there's a question there. The man in the plaid shirt. Sorry, the woman in the plaid shirt, the man is on the other side of the arm. I'm short sighted too. Sorry. Hi. Um, hi. Um, I suppose it was no punch intended with the white nose. <laughs> um, but the following on the, let me try and make it with the white nose. Um, one of the, of the issues that worries me in my portfolio is that I do not have sufficient systematic access to the students as a students. The SRC that has the largest sort of uh, uh, representativity has been elected by something like 28, 30% of the totality of the students. That's not the hell of a lot of students. So how do we need to do to have a sufficiently representative uh, voice of the students involved in, in the activities of the university <coughs> without getting these, these, these guys in competition, so to speak, with the normal system of representation. That's one of my questions. Thank you. Thank you. So two of you can choose to answer that question. There's a second question. Um, I think I'll, I'll direct this uh, to Wayne since you opened the door uh, regarding social media. Um, social media is... I don't doubt your analysis uh, that it is a very powerful tool. Um, what we are ever seeing in South Africa is it's also a very destructive tool because it gives voice to people uh, that spread hate. And I'm not talking about students here. Right? So how do we deal, and this is a difficult question, but I, I like challenging students. How do we how do we deal with social media as a potential student voice? Linking on to what, what Dr. Langer is asking, you know, um, because everybody can have a voice in social media, um, but some of them can really do a lot of damage. And how do we hear those voices? Was there a third question? There is one. Thank you. My question is, why is it really so difficult to get student participation in issues that actually are of academic nature? I don't know what other universities are doing on that. Uh, because I know we have just gone through the quality enhancement project and we desperately wanted student participation, but we didn't get that much. And even with the student success, we are trying very hard. So far, we are having students, but we don't know how long will that will last. So do students know why these initiatives are not that attractive? Okay. So given this crisis of representativity of politics generally in the world, let's start with that question first. How do we deal with the fact that student representative councils are not really more than 38% of the student population voting in them, therefore there are other competing spaces in which students say, these people don't really represent us? If you want to answer it, answer it. You pick the question you want to respond to. So Mr. Liu is going to, Ms. Liu is going to respond. Yeah, I'll try to respond to Dr. Liz's question. I was actually having a conversation with my colleagues from DRAP about this. Um, I think the one thing, all right, let me start off by saying, <coughs> during my study, I have always, my studies, I've always been an off-campus student. And what universities tend to forget is that they only house or accommodate about 15 to 20% of the student population on campus. And what I've seen at the university is that our SRC is more in tune with what's happening with 
um, students that live on campus than the ones that live off campus. And as a result, off campus students feel, okay, SRCs are just working for on campus students, so I'm not even going to vote because I don't even know what they are doing on campus. So I think if we, if we try and maybe broaden the scope as to informing students as to what the function of the SRC is and also reminding the SRC members that they actually cater for the whole student body, not just students that live on campus, but off-campus students as well. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody want to add into that? You want to, because you have another question that's directly related to you. <laughs> so you have 15 <laughs> seconds to respond to this question. <laughs> 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 now you know what it's like to be in any of my classes. Um, I just want to respond to Dr. Liz's question about the white noise and everything. I forgot to mention about um, a structure that's in place at Fitz University. It's called the Roads to Success Program. We, um, it's, it's basically designed to, to help students in the Commerce Law and Management faculty um, in terms of tutoring. So basically the program is available to first year students, third year, any year basically, but directed to first year students to help with um, knowledge in um, doing research, taking notes, how to study effectively, all that. Student and what's interesting about, what's so special about that structure is that the tutors are trained to help students not only on academic issues, but also issues that go far beyond, like social issues, if, like, like stuff like if, if you don't have accommodation, if you're hungry, if you, ha if you have personal issues, emotional issues, even mental health of students, that, that's one stigma that's, that's, that, 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 that we're not focusing on as much um, in terms of, with, with, with regards to mental health and mm -hmm. psychological factors that students um, go through. So there are structures, for example, I can't go to the SRC and complain about my personal problem, but there are other avenues that we need to think about where, where, where students can have like an individual one-on-one -on -one helping <laughs> and basically. So that's just to answer that question and to add on to the to, to today's students as well who don't have that option. We need to think about other ways to help our students, help us. Um, okay. To add on, uh, in UP we're having a program that's, that we're running, it, it actually caters at their students, uh, we're calling Learning Community. Um, well, I just want to answer the question that uh, the visitors <coughs> are asked about uh, why students are not participating in academic. Uh, it's because of, there's a, a video that's been played early uh, in the morning by from free, University of Free State, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. and as the guy who said, clarity is power. So if all the initiatives that are there, they are being put into the table and everyone can see that this is what I need from this, mm -hmm. then they'll possibly, they'll possibly pay it. For example, in our program that we're running based into day student, we clarify, we clarify, we clarify that this program is based for, under, for students who are under NSFAS, Students who are uh, financial needy, but then they are not under NSFAS, and also students who are not um, in campus, meaning they're traveling student. So now students they come, they came to us begging, to, we want to be in this program. So in all to that, we, we are meant to say that if we can find that this program is based to this, then they will attend. Thank you. There's a last point on this question because I think the answers to the social media question must still be given. No, thanks. I just want to add as well uh, 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 with my uh, limited information. But basically, the main core reason why uh, our students fail to, 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 to attend academic programs in most cases would be that I think there's a distance between prof like academias and students on the ground. Because we'll find a situation whereby if the program is being initiated, started from the base, there is no student participation at all. They don't even invite students to come and have their ideas. But now you find a situation whereby the program is on the rolling. Now they expect students to come and take part, not even understanding the background of the, of the program, not even understanding the driving mechanism for that particular program. I think mine will be to say, 
if ever there are academic programs that need to be initiated in institutions, in the institutions of higher learning, there must be proper consultations in all stakeholders of the institutions. Not saying we are formulating something for you without your presence in it, because everything it's all up. All about me must involve me at the end of the day. They usually say if you are to go far, go with people, but if you're going fast, go alone. Thanks. As a campus hopper, I've worked at at least three of the institutions on this panel in here. I've taught as a guest on one of them, and I once took a taxi minibus to a third to the, the fifth one. <laughs> I know your pain. <laughs> So, can we answer the social media question, and then can you incorporate your response in your closing remarks when I ask the last question? Because I think we're running out of time. We have about 15 minutes, 12 minutes left. The social media question, and now you really have 15 seconds. 15 seconds. So the question was, how do we deal with destructive um, hate speech on social media? I think that I had this conversation with my marketing lecturer about how lines are blurred in social media. There's no, there's no accountability. And I think that policymakers or lawmakers, I'm, I'm just a student, I don't know how the world works in, the, in, in law and everything. But those are the things that need to be considered for future generations where social media will become an everyday thing, a thing that living, breathing thing. So people need to be held accountable for what they say on social media. You know that um, maybe perhaps social media sites also need to incorporate that. And because you can delete a tweet, you can say I didn't say that. But then once it's on the internet, it's always there. So accountability needs to be discussed or needs to be thought about to make sure that people are held accountable for what they say. Because just because we have freedom of speech doesn't mean we can just say anything we want to say. Okay, so on the question of data, so much of what we've heard today in the conferences as I watch from outside was about get, getting data from students. And often there's this idea that data is quite innocent. But it's a way of surveillance, it's a way of tracking, it's a way of getting stuff about people that you may not want others to know about you, which is part of the social media problem. Because I can tell where you were <laughs> instead of in a class because you checked in on social media. Um, you know, your evaluations of a lecture become data units that can be used, your attendance at classes, your evaluation of certain activities. What are your, do you have any concerns about the use of personal student data for purposes of student support? Now, you must have heard what these are, because they're questions of privacy, they're questions of, um, you know, they're things that I never reveal to my teachers, that I didn't think was any of their business. And they're things that students, I told them not to reveal to me, because it isn't any of my business. <laughs> um, but now, with this data generation, there'll be things known about students used in their favor, but still things known about them. How do you feel about the use of data like that? And we can start with you since you got gripped out of the last answer session, and we'll close with you again. So we'll start in the middle um, with. Um, thank you very much, program director. Um, in terms of the use of data, I think the only concern despite the fact that we do understand that the authentic um, intention for the use of data is to try and analyze and see how students are progressing and try to assist the way we can in terms of the academic performance so that they can become holistic individuals. But the only concern that I think the students will have certainly is the people who we appoint to deal with the student data, and I think that's where institutions of high learning need to be very careful about who exactly are the people who we place there. I think in my view it's not going to be acceptable for someone who is almost of the same age as me, who most probably I might even have external controversial relationships with to be appointed to deal with my data. So I think universities should, I think universities should be very careful and try to alternatively put people who are far more distant to us in terms of age, because say for instance maybe he was my friend last year but we're not friends anymore, but suddenly now he is recently appointed to deal with my personal data and therefore I wouldn't feel that it is safe. Let me furthermore respond to some of the questions which were asked about um, the reasons why some students do not participate in um, programs which are initiated in some of our institutions. And I think I must 
um, unfolded the prevailing circumstances, particularly with my institution, where we must take note that Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University is located within the Eastern Cape. And the Eastern Cape is one of the most poorest provinces within the country, I think in contrast to Limpopo, but one of the two. But they are far more up there in terms of the poorest provinces within the country. And furthermore to that, our university this year has opened a system of debt relief where students were allowed to come and register for free. And they came in numbers, they don't have textbooks, they don't have cell phones, they don't have laptops, they don't have accommodation, they don't have food, they have nothing. Now how do you prioritize having to attend um, student supported programs while you still have to firstly deal with the problems that we have? Most of those students stay off campus. I've mentioned that my university accommodates a large number of students, which is 27,000 students, approximately. But only about 3,200 students stay on campus. Where's the rest of the 24,000? What time do we have for programs? When do we have time for the start of the, these programs that we have? And at what time do they end? Taking into consideration that if they start late, it becomes very much unsafe for some of the students, the 24,000, which stays off campus, to attend the programs in conditions that we are increasing the possibilities of them being attacked, assaulted, abused, because it's late. That's why we always say, and like I said before, we want more on-campus residences so that students can be in a safe environment and therefore they can have more time to attend the programs that were initiated by institutions of high learning. But for as long as we don't have that kind of infrastructure, it becomes very difficult for students to participate because of those prevailing circumstances as I have unfolded. Secondly, to the question of the SRC not having enough capacity and percentage of representation, we need to take note that the SRC has a substructure. House committee is a substructure of the SRC. In the SRC, we have societies which all account and respond to the SRC and the SRC vice versa responds and accounts to students in return. We have a student parliament, we have many different societies like I've mentioned. So it is not only the SRC that is empowered to represent the entire 27,000 students. When you speak about house committee, in SRC, in my university, we have for instance accommodations and catering officer. All house committee members in all different institutional residences account and they meet within one space together with the SRC accommodations officer and they share ideas and views and how they can transform student housing holistically. So it's not only the SRC, there are many societies to represent the students. Thank you. Thank you. It's great that this is red, it also says like it's top sign. Um, shall we have a new person? All right. uh, thank you. Um, I want to answer the, the other question uh, based on um, social media. You know, when you can when you, when you can look back on um, the scenario we had of Fizma's fall, that started in social media, and it was a voice, a powerful voice, and tool that students use to be ahead in the society. So, social media, I support my learned friend here, and also uh, to answer your question about data, data. Is a collection of, I mean, data is a substance of information. So, with, if you want a certain information, you need to have data. You collect it, put it together, and have information. For example, if you look at um, scenarios um, in certain universities, including my university, you find that the students are doing computer science, but then uh, they don't have laptops. Now, what do you do in that, in that scenario? Now, if you have data, you'll analyze that I have so many students. Now, the question is, will you buy uh, uh, the laptop for those students? Because they are in need of laptops. Now, you'll be, wasting, you'll be wasting so much money if you buy a laptop for the student. Because if you buy a, student, a laptop for this student, you have to buy for that student, for that student. And you're wasting money. Now, data will be able to save, save universities' money, but then also data will be able to improve the current resources. For example, I'm taking this example of a student who's having no laptop but is doing computer science. Now the other option will say, okay, uh, maybe the student have no laptop and then he fell. So what do we do? Do we uh, shuffle the student and say we are academically screwed up? But the student was in need. What do you do? The third option is, let's think of, of, of improving the current resources. 
that you are having. For example, they are uh, commuter labs, but the commuter labs, they close early. Now, why not we open our commuter labs 24 hours that the student may be able to have an access to those commuter labs? The data will help us in those cases. And also, in that sense, that will not, in that sense, that will not going to, uh, uh, we're not doing something new, but we're improving what we have. Right? And also, I have an issue about, about NSFAS. Um, NSFAS has done a great job. I'm on NSFAS, has supported me, has done a really great job, but they are too slow. <laughs> we apply, you apply this year for next year, and then they respond to you second quarter. Now, if they can use their data to realize that in the first quarter, students are suffering, and that if you don't grab the information in the first quarter, obviously the whole semester failed. And also the issue of trust. Thank you. The issue of trust. Um, <laughs> you know, when, 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 if you're telling me that I have to expose my personal data, but then I don't trust you, I'll give you false data, and then you run with it. But it's false. For example, we can say, no, uh, we're having an issue about financial problems. But then maybe the core issue was uh, I had my eight status changed. That would affect my academic result. But then if I can't trust you, I can't tell you that. Maybe I'm pregnant. If I can't trust you, I can't tell you that. There's so many issues, but the data, for example, the people that are holding our data or wanting to know about our data, they must be trustworthy. Thank you. Thank you so much. The two last responses will start with you and then we'll end up with Sipilel. Sipilel. Um, I have one concern um, about how data is actually collected and when it's collected. Especially biographical data um, that, that we have to like fill in and give to university before we get a placement. So in essence, there's also that ethical concern that, that, that needs to be talked about. And I and yesterday we were sure, like we ended the, the, the talk about with ethics and we need another symposium and I'd like to be invited to that symposium because it's very important <laughs> to, to, to discuss those things about when data is collected and I'd like to just reiterate um, a speech that, that, that like really struck with me from Dr. Tim Rennick when he said that we need to change the perception of how we look at things and um, it was looking at, at it from a place of designing for success Let's collect data for success. Let's look at the only, because the only way that we can build on existing structures is if we shift the culture, if we shift our perception. When are we asking students for information? In what state are we asking them? Are they vulnerable? Do they need to give the information? Those are the things that we need to, to consider and possibly change to make sure that data collection is efficient and helps us actually with our success and not move us backwards thinking we're moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. And then closing remarks from the GUT representative. Yes, thanks very much. Uh, maybe one should also start by the issue of having personal data being exposed to irrelevant individuals in a way. <laughs> the problem is that it does assist because if we are being honest now as student leadership, you can never assist an individual without him or her taking an initiative to provide information regarding his or her own matter. That's the reality of the matter. But coming back to the issue of providing this personal data, the personal data that's being provided by students, it will assist whoever is in the management of the institution dealing with matters of successing the students, not to come in a blanket approach, but to know what exactly affects students or what hinders students in their success. By example, they will know directly the roots of the problem in a way if they have been provided with the information or personal data that is relevant. But now again, coming back to the issue that was brought out on board by my colleague from NMMU, whereby the data will land in wrong hands. You see, I will then propose that if it needs to be the Department of Higher Education and Training needs to provide external independent bodies that will deal with this uh, 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 data collection. Because honestly speaking, even as students, there is a situation whereby you have attention with one of staff members of the institution. 
Now, you will go back there requesting information or requesting assistance in a way. That individual will also hold the grudge against you, uh, uh, trying to frustrate you in a way, trying to prove that he does have power indeed to, 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 to limit you in certain uh, circumstances. But nonetheless, there is also a situation whereby in our institution, our students, especially those who are dependent upon NSFAS, they will tell you there's no the problem why I've never received funding this year is because they couldn't check my background or in terms of my address on the staff by the student will tell you this. I've, upgrade, I've updated the thing long time ago in the system of the institution. Now it comes back in a situation whereby I think even the system itself that my institution uses as to keep data for these students. It's not updated on a daily basis because we find the matter whereby those people from NSRS need to assist the person, but they don't have a direct contact with the student. Now it becomes a problem. The student end up uh, suffering from those such, such issues. Thanks. And I was actually wrong. The last word from the panel will come from Ms. Khalalelo Liu, because I didn't give her an opportunity. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think the general concern that we all have is who has access and why. Um, I think as a student, we, or as students, we are always bombarded with questions or requests for data, but we are never informed as to why the data is required. And besides that, we are never given feedback after the data has been uh, um, collected as to, okay, this is the data, your biographic data was used for this and that, or whatever data is requested. We are not given feedback as to why the data was collected, and even the reports that are written uh, um, on the data that's collected. So I think it's very important that, firstly, it should be clarified as to why um, the data is being collected, and secondly, feedback should be given to the students as to why uh, um, the data was requested. Um, the other thing that I just want to quickly talk about is, um, Wayne mentioned something about the timing of the collection of data. Uh, I think I was having a conversation with Devodia a few days ago, um, and she was talking about how they are going to look at the timing of the NBT tests. For instance, if you're going to request, request students to come into the university and write the test. No, go on. Okay. Uh, if you're going to ask students to come write the NBT test, but live about 40 to 50 kilometers away from the university and they do not have money to travel to the university the, um, and all the other factors that come into play. Already before writing the test, they are stressed and obviously the stress that they're going through is going to affect their marks and the mark that I get for my NBT test will definitely say, all right, you're going to do the academic, uh, um, that writing, uh, um, what's this module, based on the, the, the marks that I, I got for the NBT test, which aren't really a true reflection of my personal academic strength. So maybe, yes, as Wayne has said, timing of collection of data is very, very important. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to wrap up there because I think people are getting ready for lunch. It's been a long day. You can engage the students on questions, but what I think has come out of the panel is the relationship of trust, that student data collection is often one-sided, that students often don't have access to similar kinds of data about the people teaching them. I remember the day when uh, university student, universities stopped publishing the publication records of their academics on notice boards for students to see what academics are doing. I also remember when academics stopped being listed in student handbooks by order of precedence in the academic system and started being listed alphabetically and recently went onto university websites and couldn't find staff lists and qualifications listed. So all this stuff that students are giving universities, universities are often not transparent about communicating to students who is teaching them, and those are also data elements. And as the students have indicated, data is not just the numbers that they reveal, it's also when I stand in front of a student, they present a set of data that I read in particular ways. 
and students experience and object to being read as certain kinds of data inputs, precisely as we've seen over the last 18 months in South Africa. So yes, data is productive, but also it doesn't require a badly intentioned person to misuse data. Some of the best abusers of data are very well-intentioned people who simply use what they see in particular ways that does not disadvantage the student, but pushes the student into a certain direction in terms of correction. So people look at their English marks and make decisions about the kind of English that they should be speaking five months after having been intervened with. It's a, ten, it's a Trevor Noah sketch, but it's also a reality for very many students on campuses every day. And so how data works, how we use it, and the support mechanisms. Because sometimes, you know, when students are sitting there, the intervention isn't actually at the macro level. The, in, the intervention is at the micro level. I know people who've had to cook for students because they have classes at 8 o'clock and they've had to leave their homes at 4 o'clock in Ishawi to get to the University of Kuzuli Natal in Peter Maritzburg. And they did it. And they did it without a program, without a structure, without you know, a large institutional intervention. Because again, it's that embodied experience that, um, the, that Ms. Liu spoke about, that students are on our campuses embodied. And there are also forms of data in those bodies, and their resistance is registered through those bodies. And without those bodies, none of us would be here. So thank you very much to our panel.